Now, I believe the growing power of public opinion helps to explain one of the interesting trends that I uncovered in the course of my research. I mean, most of my book is just a straight out narrative, trying to tell a story that's never been well told before, constructing a story around colorful personalities like Garibaldi, T. Lawrence, Michael Collins, Ord Wingate, and Edward Lansdale. But at the end, I also make what is for me a very rare foray into the thickets of social science. Because at the end, I also have a database of insurgencies since 1775, coded for outcome. And what does that database show? It shows that insurgencies have been getting more successful. Prior to 1945, insurgents were winning about 20% of their campaigns. Since 1945, they've been winning about 40% of their completed campaigns. Now, what accounts for that increase in effectiveness? Certainly some of it is due to the spread of ever more destructive weaponry, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I would argue the biggest part of the explanation is the growing power of public opinion, or to be exact, the growing ability of insurgent groups to exploit public opinion. That is the great equalizer. That is what enables even a relatively puny military force, a guerrilla group or a terrorist group, to bring down a great power, even a superpower. And by the way, this is not just an issue for liberal democracies like the United States. In the modern era, public opinion is an international force that can frustrate the designs even of dictators. Don't believe me? Ask Muammar Gaddafi. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't ask him. He's dead. The reason he's dead is because he didn't succeed in repressing a revolt that 100 years ago he undoubtedly would have repressed, but he couldn't do it in the more recent times because his very barbarism backfired on him. It led to outrage internationally and an international military intervention, which led to his downfall and death. That's how public opinion has changed the game and I think has increased the odds of success for insurgent groups. Now, having said that, I would caution against going too far in the other direction. And certainly in the decades after World War II, there was a tendency to deify guerrillas as these 10 foot tall superhumans who could not possibly be defeated by military force. A lot of that was due to the success of a handful of high profile insurgents like Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro. But their success is a little bit deceiving. Remember the statistic I just cited to you a minute ago. Even if insurgents are winning 40% of their completed campaigns in the post-1945 era, what's the flip side of that? Obviously, they're still losing 60%. And just as very few business startups become Apple or Microsoft, so too very few fledgling insurgencies ever become the Chinese Red Army or the Viet Minh or Viet Cong. And to illustrate that part of the story, I would cite to you the example of one of the most famous insurgents of all time, a man whose visage once used to decorate every dorm room wall on the planet. <laughs> and actually probably still decorates every dorm room wall at my alma mater, which is UC Berkeley. <laughs> now, how did, uh, how did Che Guevara become such a boon for makers of t-shirts and posters and such an idol of youth? Well, it wasn't just because he had a cool beret. It had something to do with the fact that in the 1950s, he and his buddy, Fidel Castro, overthrew the Batista regime in Cuba, which was a pretty significant and impressive achievement. Because here you had a small group of a few hundred ragtag bearded rebels in the hills overthrowing an established government with 40,000 troops, aircraft, artillery, tanks, all of the paraphernalia of modern war as supplied by the U.S. of A. Now the success of Castro and Guevara and their crew becomes a little bit more understandable if you peer a little bit more closely. And what you see is that by the end of the 1950s, Batista was fundamentally illegitimate, corrupt, unpopular. He'd even lost the support of the Chamber of Commerce. And that's a bad sign when you have an established regime that loses the support of the Chamber of Commerce. That's why a relatively small rebellion was able to overthrow him. But like many successful generals down through the ages, Che got cocky and overconfident. He suffered from hubris. He imagined 
he could replicate elsewhere the success that he had had in Cuba. He was to be cruelly disabused of this illusion, first in Congo and then in Bolivia, where he showed up in 1966. And there he is on the bottom right, looking especially hairy. The situation that Che found in Bolivia was, however, quite different from the one he'd encountered in Cuba, because the leader of Bolivia was not some unelected, unpopular autocrat. He was, in fact, a popular elected leader who had already instituted land reform, the chief Marxist calling card. By contrast, Che came in with a handful of outsiders, not a Bolivian among them. They didn't even speak the local Indian languages. In fact, I think it's fair to say that during his time in Bolivia, Che's best friend was his mule Chico. So it's no great surprise that by 1967, he was hunted down and killed by these guys, Bolivian Army Rangers, trained by US Army Special Forces and advised by the CIA. And this was the end of the great Che Guevara, his corpse being poked by his enemies. Now, I would submit to you that if even an insurgent as storied, as legendary as Che Guevara could ultimately be hunted down and killed, there is no insurgency so entrenched it cannot be defeated. The question is, how? Well, we're very lucky in this regard that two of the great powers of Europe ran, for our benefit, a controlled experiment in counterinsurgency in the 1950s. On the one hand, you had the French in Algeria from 1954 to 1962. On the other hand, you had the British in Malaya from 1948 to 1960. And they exemplified two very different and contrasting schools of counterinsurgency. The French were really symbolic of the scorched earth, brute force, mailed fist approach to counterinsurgency. The British approach, by contrast, has come to be seen as emblematic of what is now known as population-centric, or hearts and minds, counterinsurgency. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, if you want to see what the French did in Algeria, you don't have to sit here and listen to me, although I'm very glad you are. You can just go home and rent, if you haven't already, I assume many of you have, rent that wonderful movie, The Battle of Algiers, which is actually a pretty accurate depiction of what happened in 1957 when the FLN, the Algerian Insurgent Network, was sending off bombs in the city of Algiers. They were killing civilians, especially European civilians. Faced with this reign of terror, the French police and security forces were helpless. In desperation, they called in the elite of the French army, the 10th Parachute Division under General Jacques Massou. The paratroopers who were hardened veterans of World War II, Indochina, the Suez Operation, and other battles marched into Algiers and swiftly took control of the Caspa, the native quarter. And they began rounding up thousands of Muslim men for interrogation to find out who were the insurgents lurking in their midst. Well, we know what happened in these interrogation centers in part because of the testimony of this man, Henri Alleg, who was not himself Algerian. He was French, a French Jew actually, but he was also a communist and he ran a Republican newspaper in Algiers. And that was crime enough to get him arrested by the paratroopers. Now, I think we're all familiar with medieval instruments of torture, like the rack or the Iron Maiden. Well, Henri Alleg was to be introduced to a peculiarly modern and fiendish form of torture known as the Zizhen. This was actually a very simple, hand-cranked dynamo originally developed to power field telephones. It had a couple of clips you could attach to whoever you were interrogating, and a handle you could turn. And the faster you turn that handle, the more electricity comes out of it. Now, Henri Alleg was to learn what the Zizhen could do when he was stripped naked, taken into a room, tied to a wooden board with other straps, and he had the clips applied to his ear and to his finger. He wrote that a flash of lightning exploded next to my ear, and I felt my heart racing in my breast. I struggled, screaming. When he still would not tell the paratroopers what they wanted to know, they removed the clip from his ear and attached it to his penis. He wrote that his body shook with nervous shocks, getting stronger in intensity. 
but he still would not start talking as the paratroopers demanded. So in frustration, they hauled him off the interrogation table and pummeled him viciously with their fists. Then they introduced him to another method of torture, what they called the Tuyo, what we know better as waterboarding. He wrote, I had the impression of drowning in a terrible agony of death itself took possession of me. After this ordeal, he was tossed into a cell, left to spend the night on a barbed wire mattress, listening to the thuds and screams of other detainees getting similar treatment in other parts of the interrogation facility. Now it is commonly said that torture doesn't work. Don't you believe it? For the French at least, torture was tactically effective in the case of Algiers because using such brutal methods of interrogation, they in fact managed to crack the FLN network in Algiers in a matter of months. By the end of 1957, no more bombs were going off in Algiers. And the French could congratulate themselves that they had won their war on terror. Or had they? Well, as we know, with the benefit of hindsight, they had won a short-term tactical victory at the expense of a long-run strategic defeat. Because there was no way to conceal what was happening in this major city not far from the shores of Europe. Henri Alleg, for one, published a best-selling memoir of his ordeal. Others came forward as well. And as the French people learned how their own security forces were using Gestapo-like tactics, support for the war effort declined, and not just in France, but also in the United States, at the United Nations, everywhere around the world. So that at the end of the day, by 1962, President de Gaulle decided he had no choice but to let Algeria go. Now this, to my mind, is a pretty vivid demonstration of the dangers of being overly brutal in your approach to counterinsurgency. As it happens, at virtually the same time on the other side of the planet, a very different approach to counterinsurgency was being implemented by this man, General Sir Gerald Templer, who should not be confused with this man, the actor David Niven, <laughs> for whom he is a dead ringer. So this man, not this man, this man, took over the British war effort in Malaya. And by the way, I appreciate all of you laughing because I tried this joke out on the midshipmen at the Naval Academy and all I got was blank stares because of course they never heard of David Niven. <laughs> so thank goodness you guys are a little bit older like me so you can at least appreciate these references. Anyway, in 1952, Templer took over as High Commissioner and Commanding General of the British War effort in Malaya, which by the way in itself is significant because he combined in his own person, the supreme civil and military power, something we don't do very often, but I think is important to do. At the time when he took over, the Malayan Races Liberation Army, one of many Marxist nationalist insurgent groups at the time, was running wild. They were blowing up trains, attacking rubber plantations. When Templer drove from the airport in Kuala Lumpur to government house, he actually did so in a car, in the very same car in which his predecessor, had been assassinated a few months previously. The bullet holes were still in it. That must have been a fun ride. It would have been very understandable if under those circumstances, Templer had decided he had no choice but to terrorize the population into acquiescence. But that's not what he decided because he understood the key to victory was not in terrorizing the population, it was in controlling the population. And how did he go about controlling the population? Well, one of his most important initiatives was creating these new villages because he understood that the heart of the insurgent appeal lay among these Chinese squatters who were not citizens of Malaya, who did not have title to their land. They were outsiders in Malayan society and therefore susceptible to the siren song of communism. What Templer did was he relocated large numbers of these squatters into these new villages where they would have access to schools, sanitation, fields to till, and oh, by the way, they were also surrounded by fences and armed guards to physically prevent them from supporting the insurgency. Templer took other steps as well. He sent aircraft to overfly insurgent-held areas, not to bomb them, but to drop leaflets calling on them to surrender. Some of them even had loudspeakers attached and they would call out 
individual insurgents on the ground by name, a very spooky and effective tactic. He also discontinued the fruitless jungle bashing in which the British Army had hitherto engaged in Malaya, as the US Army would later do in Vietnam, sending large formations thrashing through the jungle in a hopeless attempt to pin down these wily and elusive guerrillas. Instead, Templar placed his emphasis on intelligence. He grew the size of special branch and placed the emphasis on pinpointing insurgent hideouts, which could then be attacked with picked troops like the SAS. He even imported hit hunters from Borneo to act as trackers for his men. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, what Templar understood was that the war was going to be won or lost among the people. Now, he's associated with two very famous aphorisms. He said, first, the shooting side of the business is only 25% of the trouble, and the other 75% lies in getting the people of the country behind us. He also said, the answer lies not in pouring more troops into the jungles, but in the hearts and minds of the people. That's where that phrase, hearts and minds, became such a catchphrase when Templar used it in Malaya. And it's often been misunderstood to suggest that the counterinsurgents are out to win the love and affection of the population. In fact, I feel that's some, how we somehow sometimes acted in the early days in Iraq and Afghanistan, showering billions of dollars of goodies on the population, hoping to win them over. It typically doesn't work out that way. In the hands of a skilled counterinsurgent like Gerald Templer, the hearts and minds approach really comes down to two very simple and yet very essential lines of operation. First, security, and then legitimacy. We've already seen how he attempted to achieve security with the new villages, with targeted raids, intelligence gathering, and so forth. But he also understood that at the end of the day, you can't keep a restive population down indefinitely at bayonet point. You have to give them some positive